All right, guys, so we're going to pick up on chapter 14. I'm going to go over some pharmacology and some medication administration as far as what EMTs are able to do. I'm going to kind of go over the process of administering the medications, some, ones, some of them that are commonly used, uh, difference in names, routes of administration, and the forms of administration. I'm going to talk about some essential medication information, uh, the key steps in administering those meds, and then what to do after you give the medications and where you can find that information from. You guys are going to be able to learn about assessment, emergency care for the patient, whose condition may require some administration of a medication. You guys will be responsible for administering or assisting the patient with the administration of certain medications. Um, however, you're not a mathematician, so you can't erase your mistakes or start over. So once a medication has been administered, you can't take it back. You can't pull it back out of the patient. So it's important and crucial that you understand the importance of medication administration and how to properly make sure that you're dosing it correctly. Medication is uh, generally defined as a drug or other substance that is used as a remedy for illness. A drug is a chemical substance that is used to treat or prevent a disease or a condition. The terms drug and medication are often used interchangeably by EMTs. However, the study of drugs is referred to as pharmacology. Medications are chemicals that are used to treat or prevent a disease or condition. Used properly, drugs can dramatically improve a patient's condition. Used inappropriately, drugs can have serious adverse effects. EMTs can only administer medications that are in their scope of practice and that have been ordered to be administered by a licensed physician. When the correct dose is administered appropriately, the patient's condition can improve significantly and uncomfortable symptoms may be relieved. If administered inappropriately, some drugs can cause serious side effects and deterioration in the patient's condition. If the order allows the EMT medication to be administered by the EMT, the EMT will obtain the aspirin, for example, and instruct the patient to chew the aspirin, and then the EMT will place the aspirin in the patient's mouth. If the orders allow only patient-assisted medication administration of aspirin, the EMT will obtain the aspirin and instruct the patient to chew the aspirin, and then the EMT will hand the patient an aspirin tablet and have the patient place it into their mouth. Medications the EMT administers are either carried out on the EMS unit or are prescribed for the patient. The prescription medications may be found on the patient or at the scene. It has become more common for EMTs to carry most of all the medications they're able to administer on the EMS unit. It is extremely important to become completely familiar with your local protocols as this dis dictates not only the medications that can be administered, the specific doses and routes, but also which medications the EMT can administer and which are to be patient-assisted medications. Oxygen is an odorless, tasteless, colorless gas that is found in the ambient atmosphere at a concentration of approximately 21%. When it is used for medical purposes, it is administered as a 100% 100% compressed gas concentration. By increasing that oxygen concentration breathed in by the patient, you attempt to put a higher concentration of oxygen into the alveoli of the lungs. By doing so, you increase the amount of oxygen crossing over from the alveoli and into the pulmonary capillaries. In healthy individuals, high concentrations of oxygen have been found to reduce cardiac output and left ventricular perfusion, which reduces systemic and coronary artery blood flow. In patients with heart disease, hyperoxia, high oxygen levels, leads to coronary artery vasoconstriction and a higher coronary artery resistance, thereby reducing coronary artery blood flow to the heart muscle. This can lead to a reduction in cardiac output, cardiac ischemia, and possibly life-threatening cardiac rhythm disturbances. In some conditions, such as ischemic stroke, in which cerebral arterial blood flow is blocked by the brain, 
or an acute coronary syndrome involving coronary artery blockage to the heart, administration of oxygen when not indicated may actually worsen the tissue damage, causing reperfusion injury. By an increase in free radical production when the artery is reopened and blood supply reestablished to that artery and the ischemic tissue. In the patient with a medical condition, if the breathing is adequate and the SpO2 is 94% or greater and no other signs of respiratory distress, hypoxia, hypoxemia, or poor perfusion are present, there is no need to administer supplemental oxygen. If the SpO2 is less than 94% or signs of respiratory distress, hypoxia, hypoxemia, or poor perfusion are present, initiate oxygen therapy with a nasal cannula at 2 liters per minute and titrate to maintain an SpO2 reading of 94% or greater. If signs of severe hypoxia are present, a non-rebreather at 15 liters per minute can be used. If the patient with a traumatic injury, especially one involving the brain, thoracic organs, or spinal cord, or one in which there are any evidence of respiratory distress, hypoxia, hypoxemia, or poor perfusion, or when the potential exists for significant bleeding or shock, the American College of Surgeons recommends that delivery of high concentration of oxygen to achieve and maintain an SpO2 of 95% or greater. This is typically achieved through using the non-rebreather mask and then setting it for a rate of 15 liters per minute using the regulator on your oxygen tank. If the bag valve ventilation is being performed on either a medical or a trauma patient, Regardless of the condition of the injury, a high concentration of supplemental oxygen must be delivered. The oral glucose is absorbed in the mouth and through the intestines and eventually into the blood, where it raises the blood glucose level, making more glucose available to the starving brain cells. The brain cells will once again begin to function normally. This is seen as an improvement into mental status. Activated charcoal. Once absorbed, the poison is carried by the charcoal through the digestive tract and then eliminated in a bowel movement. The efficacy of activated charcoal has been questioned and it may have harmful effects if aspirated. Activated charcoal has been removed from many protocols across the U.S. The administration of aspirin okay, may keep the coronary arteries that deliver blood to the heart from completely closing. EMTs don't administer it for analgesic purposes or pain relief effects. <clears throat> Inhalers are medications that cause the bronchioles to dilate, hence the term bronchodilators. They contain beta-2 agonists that are topically deposited through an inhalation route or receptor sites in the bronchial tissue. When the beta-2 receptor sites are stimulated, it causes the smooth muscle to relax leading to dilation of the bronchial. This causes a decrease in airway resistance with a resultant increase in airflow and an improvement of oxygen delivery to the distal alveoli. Most often you'll find that meter dose inhalers prescribed to patients with a history of asthma, emphysema, or chronic bronchitis. These patients have episodes of bronchoconstriction in which the bronchioles in the respiratory tract constrict increasing the resistance to the air flowing into the lungs and down into the alveoli. The patient experiences shortness of breath and signs and symptoms of respiratory difficulty from the increased effort to breathe and from the decreased flow of oxygen to the alveoli. Inhaled bronchodilators are medications that cause the bronchioles to dilate. Okay. With an SVN, the indication, action, side effects, and contraindications of the medication are the same as a meter dose inhaler, only the route of delivery is different. Nitroglycerin is used to treat patients with diseases of the heart that involve partial blockages or spasms of coronary arteries. The medication comes as a tablet or a spray, depending on what your service is ordered, that is administered under the tongue, no matter which route you take. 
Nitroglycerin dilates the blood vessels in the body, causing a reduction in systemic vascular resistance, basically causes the coronary arteries to dilate. This reduces the workload of the heart by decreasing the force of the contraction necessary to eject blood against a lower blood pressure in the aorta. The reduced myocardial or heart workload reduces a result in a decrease in the heart muscle demand for oxygen. So if you decrease the amount of work the heart needs, it doesn't require as much oxygen to work. So at the same time, nitroglycerin's vasodilation properties of the coronary arteries themselves increase the sup supply of oxygenated blood to the heart muscle. Because the major side effects are hypotension, it is important to measure the blood pressure both before and after you administer the nitroglycerin. Epinephrine constricts the vessels, which are alpha-1 and alpha-2, increasing the blood pressure, dilates the bronchioles, which is a beta-2, allowing the patient to move more air into the alveoli, and decreases capillary permeability, which is an alpha-1 and alpha-2 effect, reducing the leakage of fluid. Depending on the dose and route of Narcan and the opioid that was the patient overdosed on, the opioid may stay in the blood or in the body longer than the Narcan does. And this is what's known as a rebound effect. Therefore, it may be necessary to repeat the dose of the Narcan to continue the reverse of the opioid drug that was taken. So in addition, some opioids such as fentanyl or carfentanyl are potent and may require several repeated dosages. So if the Narcan, for example, only lasts two hours, but the Narcan or the narcotic that the patient used lasts six hours, after two hours, the Narcan is going to wear off. And if it's only been four hours since they took the, nar uh, the narcotic, they're going to need another dose so the Narcan can be in the system longer than the drug will be because if the Narcan wears off prior to the narcotic wearing off, once Narcan wears off, that narcotic or that opioid is going to attach to the cell receptor again, causing a rebound effect or causing the patient to overdose again. Narcan itself has no effect on a patient unless an opioid drug is actually present in the system. Therefore, it's usually relatively safe to administer it on either a suspected or known heroin or other opiate drug overdose. In addition, the EMT can administer it several routes, either intramuscular, subcutaneously, or intranasally. The chemical name, okay, also the chemical name describes the drug's chemical structure. It usually is the first name associated with the drug. The generic name, which is also referred to as a non-proprietary name, the generic name still reflects the chemical characteristic of the drug, but in a shorter form than the full chemical name. It's the name assigned to the drug before it is officially listed and is independent of the manufacturer. The generic is listed in the U.S. Pharmacopoeia, uh, Pharmacopoeia in a publication listed all drugs officially approved by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. The trade name is referred to as the brand name. It's assigned when the drug is released for commercial distribution. The name is usually short and easy to recall and may be based on the chemical name or the type of problem it is used to treat. This is the name the manufacturer uses to market that drug. The official name meets all the requirements of the U.S. Foreign Compeal or National Formulary are given an official name. It is commonly the generic name followed by the initials USP or NF. Here's an example, okay? Chemical name, 1,2,3-propenetriol trinitrate. The generic name is nitroglycerin tablets. The official name would be nitroglycerin tablets USP and then the trade name is nitrostat. Okay, if you're following along in your book, chapter 14-1,
Here's a common list of generic and trade name comparisons. The route of administration is the way in which a medication enters the patient's body. Okay, the route by which a medication is given affects how quickly the medication is going to absorb into the body to reach its site of action. Routes used by the EMTs include sublingual, oral, inhalation, or some drugs, intramuscular injection, but again, based on your scope of practice and what your service allows you to do. Okay, again, some common subcutaneous, sublingual, oral, inhalation, intranasal, and IM injections. Sublingual refers to under the tongue, all right? So this is when you have the patient open their mouth, lift the tongue to the top of the roof of their mouth, and you either squirt or place the tablet under the tongue, and then you instruct them to not chew or swallow and allow the pill or the fluid to absorb into the capillary beds under the tongue. Okay, an example of this would be nitroglycerin tablets or nitroglycerin spray. An oral medication is a drug taken by mouth, okay, also known as PO. Except for activated charcoal, the medication is typically absorbed in the small intestines. This is also known as an enteral, E-N-T-E-R-A-L route because it uses the digestive system to absorb the medication. The patient has to be responsive and able to swallow. Medications, for example, as an EMT, you would administer aspirin, oral glucose, or even activated charcoal. As far as an inhalation route, the medication is prepared as a gas or some sort of an aerosol that's inhaled by the patient. The method typically deposits the medication directly to the target site where the effect is needed most, which is usually in the lungs. The patient must be spontaneously breathing for this route to be effective. Medications, the EMT you will give, oxygen, meter dose inhalers, which can include albuterol, um, Combivent, Zopinex, things like that, or small volume nebulizers. As far as an IM route, which is also known as intramuscular, the drug is injected into a large muscle mass. The absorption is relatively rapid. This requires the use of a needle, therefore it poses the danger of a needle stick injury to the EMT. All right. Some discomfort is going to be felt, serious side effects can occur, and some of the medications as an EMT that you'll be exposed to these may be an epi auto injector, okay, which is called an epi pen or an AVQ or manually syringe and needle, depending if your service has approved you to be able to do that. The medication is sprayed into one or both nostrils, which is known as intranasal by a device which is called a MAD or a mucosal atomizer device. This is either attached to a syringe or built into the device itself. Okay, the mucosal atomizer device or MAD creates a fine spray of the drug particles of a specific size. The fine particles stick to the mucosal membrane of the nasal cavity allowing for fast absorption into the nasal capillaries. Then delivery of the drug directly into the circulatory system. It has been found that the delivery route can produce effects that are sometimes similar to medications being injected. All right, Narcan, okay, hydrochloride or Narcan and also nasal spray are two of those examples that you might see in the field. As far as subcutaneous, this is a medication that the route is injected under the skin into the subcutaneous layer or fatty layer. The subcutaneous injections are designed to produce a slower absorption rate than intramuscular injections. Therefore, subcutaneous administration isn't recommended for a medication that must enter the circulatory system rapidly, such as epinephrine and an anaphylactic reaction. The medication the EMT administers using subcutaneous route usually is going to be a Narcan auto-injector if available. As far as tablet forms, these are nitroglycerin tablets which goes sublingual or chewable or given by PO. So aspirin would be a great um, example of this that you would give your patient. <clears throat> liquid for injection, a common is this is an epi auto injector, the liquid substance with no particulate matter. 
Because epinephrine is injected into the muscle, it is in liquid form. A viscous okay, or thick, sticky substance that's administered to the patient is known as a gel. One of these is going to be called glucose, okay, or, glu or uh, what we call oral glucose gel of some sort, depending on what is bought through your service. It could be any number of flavors. It's thick, and it goes between the gum and the cheek in the patient. They have to be alert, oriented, and able to follow commands and have the ability to swallow. Otherwise, your patient could choke. Okay. A suspension or drug particles that are mixed in a suitable liquid. These mixtures don't remain mixed for long periods of time and have a tendency to separate. So these medications have to be shaken very well before you administer them. Otherwise, the patient doesn't get the dosage that's required. Activated charcoal is administered as a suspension. This form is actually a crystalline solid that mixed with liquid to form a suspension. Because it is a suspension, it's necessary to shake the canister vigorously prior to administration. Okay, This medication appears as a mist or an aerosol. Each spray delivers a precise measured amount of a drug to the patient. Small volume nebulizers, okay, give medication directly deposited onto the mucosal lining deep in the respiratory tract. By depositing the medication at the desired site, the effect is more immediate and direct than when given by another route, and fewer systemic side effects are usually seen. The medication comes packaged in a pre-measured and pre-mixed fixed-dosed container or inhaler, or what's called as a meter dose inhaler or MDI. Oxygen is a medication, so use it cautiously. It's inhaled and has a systemic effect on cells and organs. It is usually dosed using a regulator attached to an e-cylinder. Spray droplets can be deposited under the tongue. Nitroglycerin spray is an example of that. Okay, can also be in the form of a spray. Nitroglycerin spray is considered an aerosol that contains nitroglycerin in a propellant. Each spray delivers a precise meter dose, 0 0.4 milligrams. Okay. In the following slides, we're going to use an example of nitroglycerin so that you can see how the information applies to a medication that you will need to administer. Okay. So for each medication, you need to understand the indications, contraindications, dose, how it's going to be administered, what the actions are, and what the side effects are to the patient. The most common uses of the drug, treating a specific condition, geared towards relief of signs, symptoms, or specific conditions. Okay, So an indication for the use of nitroglycerin is chest pain, because nitroglycerin may relieve chest pain. Okay, Contraindications. Low blood pressure is a contraindication for the use of nitroglycerin, because it is, a, it is a vasodilator, so it's going to lower the blood pressure. So if the blood pressure is already low, you can't lower it more, or you could do something detrimental to your patient. It is important to distinguish between adult and pediatric or infant dosages. Too much of the drug could cause serious side effects, whereas an inadequate amount of the drug may have little or no effect. For nitroglycerin, EMTs are advised to administer one dose and repeat it in three to five minutes. Okay, the administration refers to the route and form which the drug is given. The EMT administers medication sublingually, orally, or by inhalation or by injection. Nitroglycerin, for instance, is administered sublingually in tablet or spray form. The action or the therapeutic effect and mechanism of action provide the justification for administering a particular medication. If the action described will not produce the desired effect, then the drug should not be administered. Actions of nitroglycerin include relaxation of blood vessels and decreasing workload for the heart. The desired therapeutic effects of epinephrine 
are dilation of the bronchioles and constriction of the blood vessels, which helps relieve a severe allergic reaction.